Good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure for me to, to be here. Um, the, uh, uh, Julius uh, actually left off the last sentence of my bio, which I think is particularly uh, fitting for this group, and that I've, I've been in uh, uh, long-term recovery for over 25 years. And um, yeah, thanks. Um, I, as, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm one of 23 million Americans who are in recovery. But I think particularly fitting for this group is 27 years ago, I was uh, handcuffed to a hospital bed um, as a result of uh, my own addiction. And, and so I think I represent the good work that all of you do on a daily basis in terms of understanding this as a public health issue. And I wince at the term drugs are um, because, um, uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, even though it, uh, I, you know, is a, term about coordination. Um, unfortunately, I think it's been linked to kind of previous administration's policy around kind of war on drugs. And, you know, part part of the privilege I have of joining this administration is really understanding that law enforcement and criminal justice have a, a key role to play in terms of how we respond to people with substance use disorders. But it's fundamentally a public health issue. And, and I think the mere fact that I am now the acting director of the White House Office of Drug Control Policy as someone with a public health background and, and in long-term recovery, I think speaks volumes in terms of what this administration's policy is, and quite honestly, of the work that all of you are trying to do on a daily basis. So um, uh, it, it is my pleasure to be here. Uh, and I really want to uh, thank uh, Greg Berman in terms of the work that you do, um, clearly in continuing to move uh, this issue forward. Uh, all of us were talking beforehand, and this is, a, I think, a particularly um, invigorating time for this work. In t uh, and, and, and I think we have a really great moment in time uh, around how we, you know, how do we respond? How does the criminal justice system respond to people with substance use disorders? And I think we've just seen a huge sea change in terms of the work that's been happening. And again, I look, uh, I had the opportunity to reconnect with Judge Hora, who did some work a long time ago in Massachusetts. Um, and you know, it's really been exciting. And we have, you know, all of you to thank in terms of the work that you're doing in in looking at um, uh, uh, all of these issues and how we continue to promote this. Um, I, as I look at your uh, agenda today, um, it's it's really nice when actually kind of all this stuff sinks together without planning. And um, I, I was uh, going over uh, uh, my talking points and um, um, I don't know if this is good or bad, but it's probably going to be largely repetitive with many of the speakers who came before me. And I'm looking at my good friend Gabby from the Legal Action Center who talked about the opportunities with the ACA um, and other people who've talked about um, some of the issues. So with that, I'll, I'll still go ahead anyway and, and bore you with repetition. Um, you know, uh, um, when the Office of National Drug Control Policy released this administration's uh, uh, inaugural strategy in 2010, the strategy was based on input from public health and public safety experts across the country from people in recovery, based on decades of research demonstrating that addiction is a brain disease, one that can be prevented and treated and from which one can recover. Uh, community justice, as we know, helps us reach many of the strategy's criminal justice priorities, avoiding costly and lengthy justice involvement for low-level, nonviolent offenders, connecting people with treatment, for substance use disorders and helping to keep criminal records from becoming barriers to individuals who are re-entering society and seeking education, employment, and housing. When I was in Massachusetts uh, and the inaugural strategy was released, I remember then Director Kurlikowski, who was a former police chief from Seattle, saying that we can't arrest our way out of the problem. And my ears perked up and said, this is not your average Office of National Drug Control strategy here. Um, and it's really, I think, important in terms of looking from that time, how you hear that resonating with many, many local law enforcement uh, uh, and law enforcement professionals. And I think we've come to the understanding that it's not only a, 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 a um, ineffective, um, but expensive for us to continue with policies uh, uh, around incarceration. I, you know, we were talking before, and I was trying to think of kind of a, you know, a, a nice kind of soundbite. And you know, a part of it is I think we've come to the understanding that you can't incarcerate addiction out of people. That it's not something that we can really do. And we know that that's we need to have a much more compassionate and effective response. Uh, for this reason, we have included community courts as an innovative model for justice reform in the president's national drug control strategy. Expanding real evidence-based drug policy and justice reform is a huge undertaking and one that relies on the good work that you do each and every day. Having spent most of my career in addressing public health issues at the state level, I have a, a, a special appreciation for the work that you do. 
um, prior to coming to ONDCP, as uh, Julius talked about, I was served uh, for over 20 years in the Massachusetts Health Department. Um, our experience with health care reform showed us the potential for expanding access to care for people who've never had regular or consistent care for any condition, including substance use disorders. In the beginning that we found, despite coverage for treatment, many individuals with substance use disorders, particularly the justice-involved population, were not accessing care. And even though we saw um, uh, uh, about less than 2% of the general, general adult population who remain uninsured, we still saw about 20 to 22% of people who were coming to treatment who were uninsured at the time. Many of those uh, uh, were uh, referrals from the criminal justice system. So we know, obviously, our work in terms of connecting people from the criminal justice system, from, uh, uh, um, uh, from incarceration uh, back into the community is pivotal to the work that we're doing. Um, and some of it was as, as basic as giving folks, um, uh, giving ex-offenders uh, valid IDs so that they can enroll in care. So there's some really, not only is it about connecting care, but making sure they have the necessary paperwork and they know how to navigate the systems to get in, enrolled. And so if the Massachusetts experience bears out nationally, the expansion of health care through the Affordable Care Act is a great first step. But facilitating links and providing comprehensive support are also critically important to successful outcomes for justice-involved individuals with substance use disorders. In addition to treatment, it takes housing, employment, and sometimes even the form of an identification. So the Affordable Care Act is the most significant piece of drug policy reform in generations. Expanding access to and parity for treatment for an estimated 62 million Americans. Treatment should not be a privilege to those who can afford it, but a service available to those who need it. Of the 23.1 million Americans who need treatment for a substance use disorder in 2012, only 2.5 million actually received treatment they needed at a specialty facility. It's only about one in nine. Can't think of any other disorder that has that sort of treatment gap. This is absolutely unacceptable. I think I skipped a page in my self-righteousness. <laughs> um, the Affordable Care Act is the best tool we have to ensure that people get the substance use disorder tre treatment they need by requiring insurance companies to cover treatment for these diseases just as they would cover any other chronic illness. The law extends the reach of parity requirements by making mental health and substance use disorder treatment one of the 10 essential benefits health insurers are required to cover. There is also the potential to expand recovery support services offered by community organizations. These services can help prevent relapse, can help people address the underlying problems that lead to a relapse and get back on track, and can offer the supportive services people with substance use disorders need for long-term recovery. In this arena, leadership opportunities include not only ensuring that insurance benefits are comprehensive and address the full spectrum of substance use disorder services, including prevention, early intervention, treatment, and recovery support, they also include working to make sure that people transitioning from the justice system to the community are enrolled in health care coverage. By their very nature, community courts are poised to help participants and the, uh, and the community access health care and find ways to pay for it through the Affordable Care Act. I'm told, for example, that Spokane, Washington Community Court has also developed, has already developed a relationship with local organizations through which dedicated community health workers or navigators provide access to health care and coordination services for community court defendants. In addition, an, another local partner provides a dedicated staff member to the community court on hearing days to enroll defendants with health insurance under the Affordable Care Act. More courts can use a similar model, and I hope you will use the frequent contact you have with both with both potential patients and providers to help improve the health and well-being for your communities. More than 8 million people have already enrolled through the state and federal exchanges and healthcare.gov, and more than 3 million Americans have gotten coverage through Medicaid expansion. Of the more than 40 million currently uninsured Americans, the majority can find a plan for $100 a month in, in 2014 under Medicaid expansion. As leaders in justice, correction, and healthcare, you have an important role in helping communities and helping people access affordable health care in your states and communities. We must also embrace effective, appropriate, evidence-based treatment mechanisms. Like many chronic diseases, substance use disorders can be effectively treated over the long term with the help of medications. Behavioral therapies are an important component of treatment, 
but many individuals with opioid use disorders require medication-assisted treatment, as do many people with, heart, uh, with diabetes and heart disease. And I, I think you heard from Dr. Phil Coffin uh, earlier uh, today in terms of the effectiveness of medication-assisted treatment. And we also know, I'm uh, diverting from my script a little bit, is not only do we have a treatment gap, but we also know that uh, medication-assisted treatment is the standard of care for people with opioid dependence, and that we have a significant gap, and quite honestly, a gap within our criminal justice settings about using medication-assisted treatment as, a, as, as an effective therapy. Not only is it an effective therapy, but I think you know, you know, all you have to do is turn on the news these days and open a newspaper to hear about the magnitude of the overdose issue that we're facing here in the United States. So um, uh, the last year we have full data, 2010, 100 people a day were dying as a result of an opioid-related overdose, 100 people a day. And part of what we know is not only is medication-assisted treatment effective, the most effective therapy that we have for people with opioid dependence, but it's an effective overdose prevention strategy. And uh, I can tell you that the work that's been done here in San Francisco and in Baltimore has demonstrated that uh, by giving people who are opioid dependents long-term medication-assisted treatment, uh, we give them good care, but we also diminish the magnitude of the overdose problem that we have here in the United States. The Food and Drug Administration has approved three medications for the use in the treatment of opioid use disorders, methadone, naltrexone, and buprenorphine, as well as several, several for alcohol use disorders. We also encourage primary and specialty care providers treating justice-involved populations to provide these medications as, as a comprehensive approach to treating opioid use disorders, including those involved in prescription drugs. Regardless of whether a person is incarcerated under community supervision or re-entering the community, he or she should not be denied a viable and evidence-based medication to support long-term recovery. For example, jail health services can provide medication for those in custody and develop an opioid replacement therapy program that connects newly released individuals with community-based clinics for follow-up care. Doing so not only improves outcomes, but it saves lives by reducing overdose deaths. This morning, I went, met with many folks for, uh, here in the San Francisco um, uh, uh, Health Department and uh, with the chief of police to talk about approaches in terms of, of, of looking at linking people who are coming out of the San Francisco jail with medication-assisted treatment. So there's lots of work being done there. Treating opioid use disorders with every tool at our disposal helps us address another growing public health issue, overdoses. The Obama administration is working to address the epidemic of prescription drug abuse, supporting public education, monitoring, disposal, and enforcement of existing laws to ab abate the availability of non-prescribed medications and reduce the misuse of these legal substances. At the federal level, we have developed resources for prescribers. My office worked with the National Institute of Drug Abuse to develop two free online tools for on safe prescribing for pain and managing pain patients who misuse or who abuse uh, prescription opioids. These courses provide health information to professionals and critical skills to manage high-risk patients and prescribe medications safely. These are steps in the right direction, but we are still losing far too many people. Unfortunately, recent data also suggests an uptick in the use of heroin, an opi uh, another opioid involved in a significant number of overdoses. We must focus on preventing overdose deaths. As we have done in identifying the warning signs of a stroke or a heart attack, we can help save lives by recognizing the signs and symptoms of a, an opioid overdose and helping victims get care in a timely manner. Education is the first step, but we are also promoting uh, the use and access of the opioid overdose refer, uh, reversal drug, naloxone, among people who are likely to encounter overdose victims, such as first responders. Our office has partnered with law enforcement organizations across the country to promote expanded naloxone access and training on overdose prevention. If you don't know about it, naloxone is a medicine that can rapidly reverse an overdose caused by opioids. Where states have equipped police officers and other first responders with naloxone, the outcomes have been nothing short of miraculous. The police department in Quincy, Massachusetts, not Quincy, Quincy, Massachusetts, has partnered with the state's health department to train and equip police officers to resuscitate overdose victims using naloxone. Since October 2010, in this very small town of 60,000 residents, 
Officers in Quincy have administered naloxone uh, in more than 220 overdose events, almost all of them resulting in successful overdose reverse reversals. Overdose prevention information and naloxone kits can and should be included as part of the reentry process. In Massachusetts, the overdose prevention plan included education for those at high risk of overdose, overdosing and linking them to community services upon release. The San Francisco County Jail's HIV and Integrated Services Program provides training on how to use naloxone in the event of an overdose and offers naloxone kits to individuals upon release from custody. Community courts can also play a role by helping those individuals, their caretakers, and their families access a range of supported services, including naloxone and drug treatment with medication-assisted therapy. We cannot discuss substance use disorders in this setting without acknowledging the prevalence of substance use disorders among those in the criminal justice system, the lack of treatment infrastructure, and the risk of severe consequences. The administration's drug policy is built on the scientific foundation that a substance use disorder is a disease. Any successful criminal justice reform program must therefore address substance use disorders as a root cause in the cycle of drug use, arrest, and incarceration. Among men on probation and parole, untreated substance use disorders pose a significant problem. More than 40% of probationers and more than 38% of parolees have substance use disorders. No secret to this audience. But less than 20% of each group receive treatment at a specialty facility. The Affordable Care Act is an important in the expansion and success of evidence uh, effective diversion programs, and it also plays a key role in helping people stay out of the criminal justice system in the first place. I have talked about the ACA in regard to treatment, but it's critically important for prevention as well. It is not difficult to see it, that if untreated substance use disorders play a part in getting someone involved in the system, prevention services can play a role in keeping them out. Preventive care is part of primary care services. If we see the warning signs, we, uh, if we intervene before the illness or condition worsens, if we remain engaged in a person's preventive regimen and care, as we do for other conditions, preventive measures for addiction may help someone from getting tangled up with the criminal justice system in the first place. Substance use disorders, as I often say, is a disease that we let people progress to their most acute condition before we decide to intervene. Uh, not good for our healthcare system and certainly not good for our criminal justice system. And part of our strategy is to embed early and periodic screening intervention and referral to treatment for those points, for those, uh, particularly for those folks who are developing a problem. Under Attorney General Holder's leadership, the administration is taking significant steps to divert low-level, nonviolent offenders into services and community probation instead of federal prison. Reserving the harshest penalties for the most serious drug offenders can also help reduce inequality in the justice system and avoid locking people up for crimes related to their substance use disorder. States engaged in the Justice Reinvestment Initiative are examining their sentencing and corrections models and using data to make decisions about legislative reforms that will help reduce the number of people behind bars while still maintaining the safety of their communities. We need to reduce the prison population and break the cycle of drug use, arrest, and incarceration and connect nonviolent drug offenders to sentences and sanctions that employ evidence-based treatment rather than incarceration alone. And we must start by educating the, uh, the people who will come into contact with nonviolent offenders. Criminal justice professionals must understand that addiction is the disease of the brain that can be treated and from which people can recover. Often this disease can be a factor involved in motivating criminal behavior. ONDCP is supporting the development of training for law enforcement on the science of addiction. While we know that officers must put public safety first, Understanding the people who they come in contact with can only improve the outcomes for people with substance use disorders and their communities. ONDCP is also supporting a system change initiative for criminal justice practitioners and policymakers on this issue. We also recognize that the justice system must have options. The most effective approach is to develop a full continuum of interventions that include appropriate supervision and services at every stage of the criminal justice system. This means connecting people with treatment services that match their needs while they remain in the community, a principle familiar to those of you who are working in, in community justice. 
Community courts are already helping to reduce the number of defendants incarcerated at first appearance and expand the use of alternative sanctions. In New York City, the Center for Court Innovation and its partners have created, as I'm sure you know, the uh, Brooklyn Justice Initiatives, a diversion opportunity for misdemeanor defendants who otherwise would be detained because they cannot pay small amounts of money for bail. Rather than sitting in jail to await trial, defendants are linked to social services, including drug and alcohol treatment, and staff from Brooklyn Justice Initiatives monitor their compliance with conditions, uh, with conditions of release. ONDCP is also funding an initiative to develop a model for practitioners outlining the appropriate interventions, supervision, and services for individuals at every stage of the criminal justice process. The development of this model is a collaborative effort among criminal justice organizations, national experts, and practitioners. This initiative will include training and technical assistance to help jurisdictions um, allocate resources for programs and strategies and reduce recidivism. Rethinking drug policy is not necessarily an easy task. Much of the work is done at the state and local levels. So I'm glad that I had the opportunity to share our federal perspective and to hear the exciting work that's happening here and around the country. Moving forward, I hope all of you will be leaders in, in continuing to establish a more comprehensive system of care for individuals with substance use disorders. Advocate for the availability of life-saving measures and support people re-entering their communities from a period of incarceration. I also urge you to consider how you might better connect the participants in your community court with the benefits of the Affordable Care Act, realizing that we only have one Gabby, um, to improve the overall well-being and make solid connections with health care providers in your area. I encourage you to incorporate medication-assisted treatment and overdose prevention program as part of your community justice strategy. I also ask that you incorporate solid recovery supports within your community and draw on them to bolster people's chances of long-term success. Once again, I really want to thank the Center for Court in Innovation for challenging us at the federal level to make sensible improvements for, getting caught up in the, for, uh, for those getting caught up in the criminal justice system. I look forward to continuing this conversation and working with you to make our country safer, healthier, and more just. Thank you. Thank you.